You're listening to an archived Cabral Concept podcast. After listening to this show, check out the most up-to-date podcasts available at stephencabral.com slash podcasts or search directly on iTunes. And now, welcome to the Cabral Concept, where board-certified naturopath and integrative health practitioner Dr. Stephen Cabral shares how he was diagnosed at the age of 17 with a life-altering illness and given no hope for recovery. It was only after studying and traveling all over the world did he discover how to combine ancient Ayurvedic healing practices with state-of-the-art naturopathic and functional medicine to fully rebalance the body and re-energize it with life. It's time to discover how to get well, lose weight, and finally feel alive again. And now, here's your host, Dr. Stephen Cabral. Excited to do a follow-up from last Tuesday's show, which were the seven signs of stress not to ignore. So last week, I went over different things that you can do at home on your own to honestly just test yourself for how stressed you are. How well is your body doing under stress and is it starting to break down? Because if you know those symptoms, if you know what to look for, you will be able to hopefully prevent that upcoming dis-ease of the body because there are always signs. The body shows very specific signs as it's breaking down. So I do hope you tuned into that. That was episode 1005. Just go to stephencabral.com forward slash 1005. But now today, I want to go over the official lab warning signs. So the official lab warning signs of stress and inflammation that your doctor may be ignoring. And I'll tell you why. Because there's a huge difference between how conventional medicine doctors look at blood work and how naturopathic or functional medicine doctors look at blood work. There's a big difference. The difference has to do with not allowing the numbers just to be out of range. What we care about from a natural health perspective is how close are you to moving out of range? And if you're within 10, 20%, it's not good enough. And especially if we have your blood work from the last year, two years, three years, because then I get to see trends. So whenever I work with someone in my practice, I say this, okay, this is what your blood work looks now. What did it look like a year ago? How about five years ago? I want to know when people get into their 40s, 50s, and 60s, what was their blood work earlier in life? And they're not always able to get that, and that's okay. But I want to see a baseline. We're always talking about, oh, you know, my testosterone's low or progesterone's low or someone's estrogen low. But how do we know? How do we know that that's a low level for them? Because, you know, to be honest, if it's out of range, of course it's low. But if we're talking about testosterone, the range is enormous. For a lot of lab work, it's between like 480 and 1100. So for you, you know, as a male, you might say, well, good for me used to be 900 to 1000. But another guy, it might have been 700, 800, right? You have to know what your baseline was in the first place because that's what matters. A guy might be at 500 to 600. Now, the guy who's typically around 1,000, well, that's at half. He's going to feel terrible. But someone else, we can help another guy just raise those levels up 200 points or so, and they feel fantastic because that's what it was like when they were in their you know late teens and early 20s. So you always have to look at bioindividuality with a lot of the hormones, but that's not what we're talking about today. What we're talking about today is very straightforward numbers on lab work that anyone can run. Anyone can ask their PCP to run, or you can do an at-home lab test if you choose to. I'm going to give you those four different areas today. It's very, very important we look at those because they're not always requested on blood work. Now, if we're not requesting on blood work, and especially at the right time of the day, we don't actually know how our body's responding to stress. There's a lot of people in life right now that are stressed, but because of constitutional factors, genetic factors, etc., their body's not breaking down in the same way as other people. So yes, genetics matter, but it's the environment, it's the lifestyle, it's the diet, it's basically all environment. That's what we talk about that affects that person that degree. So let's not use genetics as an excuse, but let's not ignore them either. So what I look at is this. If I'm having someone go in and they say, okay, you know, I want to use my health insurance, so I'd like to have my blood work run. I say, okay, here's the numbers that I want you to request. Beside your typical CBC, beside your typical you know, lipid profile, whatever it might be, I want you to run these numbers. And they say, okay, And sometimes their PCP will say yes, and sometimes they'll say no. And I understand from an MD's perspective that the person may not be, you know, really coming in, presenting with any symptoms that they'd have to run this, this, or this. But, you know, the problem is that it's your health insurance, it's your body, you should be able to run it. That's what I don't understand, especially in the United States, is that we're not allowed to really work on preventative medicine. We're really not a healthcare-based company, and that's the healthcare-based country. 
And that's the sad truth. We're a sick care-based nation. When someone's sick, we'll run the lab work. When someone's sick, we'll pay for the medication. But we're not trying to keep people well. We're not really practicing health care. We're practicing sick care because the only people who get any attention and get any of their lab work covered are those people that are already sick. Now, should they get their lab work covered? Of course. But what about a nation of people that are trying to stay well? And what about how much less money it costs the nation to actually keep people well? And that's why Europe and a lot of other countries are doing it much better where they're paying for a lot of these preventative-based treatments. They're actually paying for gym subsidies and a lot of exercise base, and they're paying for functional medicine, but we're just not doing it here. Maybe it will be the future. I'm optimistic, but you know I don't see it anytime soon. That's for sure. It's going to most likely be, well, it's going to be an act of, I don't even know the best way to, to phrase it, but an act of God will say to actually change what's going on right now in the United States healthcare. So I don't think that will be here for quite some time. Luckily, you can always run your own lab test. That's the nice thing. I mean, that's really what we're trying to do with equilibrium nutrition is just say, listen, we want to put the power back in your hands. You can order your own labs for yourself. You can order your own supplements. You can do whatever you need to do for your body. This is just an outlet for you to be able to do that. And if you don't know what they mean, well, that's why we also include the health consultation with it because of course you're not going to know what they mean. You know, that's not your job. And I mean, the thing is too, when a lot of people run blood work with their doctor too, their doctor is not even explaining it. They're like, oh, this is high. This is low. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. Well, what if it's not fine? What if it's like one point away from being out of range? A lot of people are literally, I'm not kidding you, one-tenth of a point. We're talking about a lab range. Let's say it's vitamin D and the range is 30 to 100, okay? So the ideal range is 50 to 70, maybe 50 to 80 if we want to push it a little bit more to boost the immune system, okay? Maybe during a cold and flu season or someone's dealing with some type of immune-based issue. But you could be a 31 and you're, a lot of times doctors will be, I guess, unless they're trained in functional medicine, the doctors say, oh, vitamin D is fine because you're 31. That's not optimal. Optimal is 50 to 70. Or you know, it could be something, again, with TSH. The range, luckily, they're starting to fix this, but the range is 0.5 to 5. It's this insane range for a lot of lab work, but the ideal range is 0.5 to 2. So, you know, we let people go to maybe a 2.5 or really before we really start to intervene. But what if someone's a 4.9? Like they're so far gone from an optimal thyroid on their TSH, their thyroid stimulate hormone, but still nothing is done. And if it is, well, someone's just put on level thyroxine or they're put on some other type of medication that artificially gives their body thyroid, but we never ask why. So I can't begin to urge you enough to truly begin to look at your lab work and to look at it from a functional medicine perspective. And I'm going to give you one more reason why I need you to understand why this is so important, is that the body gives you clues. I've done a few shows now on bioregulatory medicine and how the body develops disease. I do hope that you go back, you listen to previous podcasts at stephencabral.com forward slash podcast. But one other one that you can listen to is just stephencabral.com forward slash 998. So if you didn't listen to 998, please listen to that. And if you haven't listened to 1005, do listen to that because one talks about the disease progression. The other is the seven physical signs of stress, inflammation building up the body. And today is the lab warning signs. So the reason why I'm relaying this information, that's all I'm doing is I'm relaying the information from thousands of research articles that I've read and thousands of books and years and years of study is like, this is what I've seen is that our body gives us hints. It's telling us first, very quietly and subtly. Second, starts to ramp it up a little bit more, but it is telling us, it's giving us the actual signs that there is a dis-ease of the body. The body's starting to move out of equilibrium. It's not as easy for the body to keep it balanced. That's called dynamic equilibrium. The body's always fighting to stay balanced. Well, sometimes it begins to lose those battles, and then we start to lose the war, which then ends up as the autoimmune condition or high cholesterol or hypothyroidism or Hashimoto's, you name it, right? It could be skin conditions such as psoriasis, eczema. Well, there are signs before that. There are signs before that if we pay attention. Now, the easiest way to do this is simply to run your lab work every six to 12 months, 12 months at the very, very latest, six months until you get everything corrected. 
And then I would do it every six months if I were the, over the age of, let's say, 55, 60 years old. I would just, you know, I would say, why not? Like, I would really look at it and just say, I want to make sure that I catch something before it gets out of range. That's my personal opinion, but I think it's the smartest way to do it. And that you don't then have to deal with the repercussions of then really trying to get things back into balance because that's the harder part, right? If we can keep ourselves healthy, if we can keep ourselves in balance, so much easier to stay that way. Okay, let's go over those four ways right now. They're not complicated. I'm going to give you exactly what to look for, how to run it with your PCP, how to run it on your own. Okay, here's what I want you to do. We're going to start first with the hormones. Now, there are a bunch of hormones you can run, and we talk about those hormones, okay? Okay. They're cortisol, they're progesterone, they're estrogen, they're testosterone, and DHEA. Those are the five hormones. Great to run them all. But here are the two that I want you to look at. Remember, we always use the 80-20 rule in my practice. We believe that, and we've seen that 20% of everything that you do gives you 80% of the results, right? And that's called uh, Pareto's Principle. I didn't make that up. So what we look at with Pareto's Principle, and I did a podcast on that back in the day as well. So if you want to go to stephencabral.com, forward slash podcast and just type in P-A-R-E-T-O and you will find that podcast. So the reason why I singled this out to look at cortisol and progesterone, although the others would be great to look at, is that cortisol when high is a dead giveaway that the body's under a large amount of stress. When cortisol is staying higher later in the day, especially towards the evening, it doesn't have to be out of range. It just has to be functionally elevated, greater than 75% or more at night especially. And if it's lower than 75% upon waking, you know that the body's now suffered more of a chronic-based stress. It's starting to not be as strong as you were used to be when your body could produce more cortisol because your body had more of the get up and go. So, and again, I've done many, many shows on how your body produces cortisol and the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis. So I do recommend checking out those as well. I want to do one specific show today and those are the lab work. Now, the reason I don't recommend looking at DHEA and testosterone right away, although great to look at, again, look at them, but they can vary. So they can be very high, DHEA and testosterone, during acute-based stress. They can be untouched, or they can actually start to drop down low uh, during chronic-based stress, which is what we see all the time in my practice. But even uh, sometimes, again, there's always some outliers, and a few women actually have higher amounts of testosterone under stress And we typically see more of the PCOS-based symptoms in those women as well. A lot of times, the Pitta-based body type as well, sometimes elevated blood sugar levels, elevated testosterone. We see that quite often in the body type and also in the women that we work with with PCOS-based symptoms. So I want you to look at elevated cortisol or cortisol that's now starting to plummet, showing chronic stress, the body's inability to deal with stress. Okay, here's the other part though. And if you have lower cortisol, by the way, you're going to have higher levels of inflammation because If you don't have enough cortisol, inflammation goes unchecked. Now, lower progesterone is very important. If you have lower levels of progesterone, mainly we look for this in women. We run it for men as well, but mainly we look for it in women. Then we are already looking at someone who's under a greater amount of stress and their body's beginning to sacrifice or use up progesterone as a way to create more cortisol in the body to produce that fight or flight or survival-based hormones. So we have a lot of podcast on this, but I would love for you to check out episode 978, how stress and dieting leads to infertility and low hormones. And then there's one more show that we have to share with you, and it's how stress shuts down the female hormones. Let's see if I can find the number to that, because that's been one of our more popular shows. I can't find it right now, but literally if you type in how stress shuts down the female hormones, you will find that show. So it could be 978 just under a different title. All right. So check that out. And I'm still looking for it. Okay, that must be it, 978. So that will give you all the reasons why. So I want you to look at cortisol and I want you to look at progesterone. Cortisol is elevated or starting to drop in the morning. We've got stress-based issues. If progesterone is on the lower side, not higher side, but on the lower side, we're looking at absolutely signs of more chronic-based stress. All right, moving on now to the thyroid. We've spoken about the thyroid before. But I wanted to give you a new marker that we don't always talk about as much. Very difficult to get it run. We actually don't run it as much in my practice, but we run all the other markers, which shows if it would have a tendency towards reverse T3. And I'll explain that right now. So we always look at TSH. So you're going to ask your PCP or MD to run your TSH. Okay, that's thyroid stimulating hormone. Important to run because it's basically telling you, you're getting a look at what your brain's telling your body to do. 
because it's thyroid stimulating hormone. It's not the hormone itself, but it's telling the body to stimulate this hormone. So stimulate some thyroid hormone. That's basically what the hypothalamus is telling the pituitary gland to tell the thyroid what to do. Thyroid stimulating hormone. So the higher it is, the worse. I know it doesn't make sense when you're first looking at it, but the higher your TSH, the worse. It actually means the lower your thyroid output, hypothyroidism. Because if your body's telling you to produce a lot of thyroid hormone, guess what you don't have a lot of? Thyroid, because your body works on positive and negative feedback loops. So the feedback loop is telling the hypothalamus to say, we still don't have enough thyroid inside of the cell. Let's make more. And your body says, okay, we'll make more. And so that's what it does. We see a high TSH. Again, the range 5 to 2.0, not up to 5, not 3.5, 5 to 2.0, 2.5 maximum. Okay, and 2.5 maximum only if, if these next two numbers are good. You want your T4 within range, and you want your T3 within range. I can't always give you the numbers because very. I like a one to two for T4 on ours, and a two to three, uh, two to three on the three on the T3 for ours. Two to three, and yes, yes, exactly, and then the three for the T3. So now reverse T3 though is a wild card, and here's why: we can tell what reverse 3T is doing. So it's called RT3 on lab work. If you want to lowercase R, capital T. Three. Okay. So if you want to request that by your MD, you can absolutely do that. Now, under stress, here's the interesting thing. Under stress, your body can be making the right amount of thyroid. You can have the right amount of iodine, selenium, everything else that your body needs. But under a great amount of stress, also toxicity, also heavy metals, your body, viruses, it could be anything, any stress in the body, because all of those are forms of stress, can actually shunt T3 away to become reverse T3, which is essentially unusable by the body. So this is really important. But the way that we can find this out is actually by running what's called a thyroid adrenal hormone lab. And the way that we see that is if your cortisol levels show stress, and if we run a hair tissue mineral analysis and we see stress, we can assume that there's a larger amount being shunted towards reverse T3. So you can run it or not, but it's a great number to run if you can, especially if you're suffering from a lot of those low thyroid-based symptoms. And again, I would love for you to tune back into previous podcasts and check out all of those symptoms of low thyroid because a lot of people don't know about those. Episode 943, we're going through a lot of back shows today. Go to stephencabral.com forward slash 943 for unsuspecting thyroid symptoms that go unnoticed. All right. So the next part we're going to move on to is actually your blood sugar. Now, last week I gave you your fasting glucose to do right at home. Super simple test. You can get your own little glucometer on Amazon. I I linked it up there. You can get a glucometer at your local drugstore. No prescription needed. And you can test your fasting glucose in the morning. Okay, that's great. But oftentimes before the glucose starts to go, we'll, we'll be able to pick it up on blood work under two numbers. One is insulin and number two is hemoglobin A1C. That's as capital H, lowercase g, capital A, one, lowercase c, if you want to request it on your blood work. So again, why does this matter? Well, yes, you'll run your fasting glucose on blood work as well, but insulin is going to be a great indicator in the, in the beginning of high stress because sometimes hemoglobin A1C, and I'll get to that in a moment, and fasting glucose are okay, but insulin can be elevated. That can show you multiple reasons why that the body's either been in a fasted state for too long, form of stress, or it's stressed and it's producing what? Well, it's producing glycogen. It's breaking down glycogen, sorry, it's producing glucose, but it's breaking down glycogen to bring glucose into the bloodstream under a stressful-based situation. And that's doing what? Well, it's then elevating insulin levels. And the insulin, because your body didn't use up the sugar, if you're just stuck in traffic or you're just sitting down and you're stressed because you're either, you know, you're stressed, you have anxiety, things are going on, the gut, whatever might be happening, or you drank a big cup of black coffee and your body starts to ask, well, because it's in fight or flight, so now it's asking for glucose but you don't use it because you're not moving your body to burn off that glucose. Well, what can happen is then your body still produces the insulin. It produces the insulin because your blood sugar levels went higher. Your body automatically does that. So what we get to do is look at insulin levels on blood work. So really, really great to look at. Now that hemoglobin A1C is an interesting one because this is basically giving us a 90-day snapshot of what your blood sugar has been like over the past three months. So not just a fasting every day, but what's it been like throughout the day, you know, and, and over the last 90 days? So I love running the uh, hemoglobin A1C as well. Again, cortisol, progesterone, if you want to run DHEA, testosterone, estrogen, fantastic. TSH, T4, T3, 
are all great. You can run the uh, reverse T3 as well. All of those, oh, and then insulin and hemoglobin A1C. Okay, all of those except reverse T3 are all on the thyroid adrenal hormone lab that you can run right at home. It's an amazing lab, your choice, or ask your PCP, see if you can get your health insurance to cover it as well. Sometimes they will, sometimes they won't. The problem is you still need someone to read it. Unless your MD is a functional medicine doctor, you may not be able to get the readings that you're looking for. And if you're asking yourself, well, why it doesn't make any sense, my doctor is a doctor, went to school for a medical degree, why wouldn't he be able to read my lab results? Well, she or he can read your lab results. The problem is that they didn't go back and do functional medicine-based work to look at the optimal levels. So MDs are trained from a disease-based model. And again, like this is nothing against MDs. But when you study a disease-based model, you practice a disease-based model. And so if you're within the lab range, you don't technically have a disease. It doesn't mean you have optimal health, but you don't have a disease, and that's the truth. But the problem is they're not helping you to prevent the disease. So that's what we want to work on is really disease prevention, but also go deeper as to why it may be there and to look at trends. If all of a sudden you start trending from thyroid at 0.8, two years later, 1.5, Another year later, 2.0. For me, it's like, why wait? Why are we waiting for you to be hypothyroid? Why are we waiting for you to be out of range? It could simply mean you're mineral deficient, or it could mean that you picked up some mercury or toxins along the way, and we need to remove that. And that would fix the issue. So it really has to be a preventative-based care. I can't recommend that enough. Okay, moving on. The last part is this, and this you can easily run with your PCP or MD, and I can't recommend enough. Most people are going to have their doctor run a lipid profile. This simply means this. They're going to run their cholesterol. They're going to run their LDL, so low-density lipoproteins. That's We typically call that the bad cholesterol or just oxidized cholesterol. And then we run the HDL, all right? And that's what we're looking at that is more of an antioxidant-based cholesterol. So we call it the good cholesterol, but we certainly don't want it too high. HDL too high, a lot of times your MD will say, oh, that's great. Your HDL is really high. I don't say that. When I see HDL above a 90, I say, why is this person producing so much of the antioxidant form of cholesterol? What is going on? Because it can mean inflammation in the brain. It can mean all sorts of different things, okay? So I look at that as well. It can mean autoimmune-based processes, some type of inflammation typically, or oxidation, lipid peroxides, you name it. What I do is I run those, of course. I'm looking at their LDL, HDL, and I'm looking at total cholesterol. So that's your number. Typically, want to keep that under 200. There are arguments to be made to keep it at 220 or below. But again, it really depends on another thing that I'm going to name right now, which is your total cholesterol to HDL ratio. They call it your cholesterol ratio, but it's done by dividing the HDL by your total cholesterol. Now, this is such a huge factor. Again, a lot of MDs are not doing this. This number is paramount. You want your number below a three to one, okay? Men and women, okay? Men and women, but really, we want all men for sure to be below that three to one because your chance for cardiovascular disease is just so much higher. So I want you to get your LDL, your HDL, your cholesterol, and if they don't do your cholesterol ratio, you know how to do the math now, okay? Just divide that cholesterol by the HDL, look for a 3.1 ratio or less, three of the cholesterol to two to one of the HDL, okay? Really, really important. Now, those they'll typically run, okay? So you have that information, but these you have to request. I would love for you to run your CRP and even your high sensitivity CRP if they'll run it. Why? Here's why. For your CRP, these are easy things to check for that can be the difference between literally life and death. And that's not an exaggeration. And I'm going to share why in just a moment. CRP stands for C-reactive protein. It has to do with an acute base inflammation of the body. It's, it doesn't have to do with anything specific, but it tests inflammation of in the body. Okay. But this next one does. Homocysteine. So many doctors are not running homocysteine. Well, here's why it's important. We're looking at arterial-based inflammation. When we look at arterial-based inflammation and we see CRP is high, so I don't like homocysteine above a 9, definitely not above a 10, Okay, but that's still within range. Oftentimes, the labs can go up to 15. CRP can go all the way up to a 3. I want it below a 1. And cholesterol, I like the ratio 3 to 1 or less for the total. I like the LDL below 110. I mean, ideally, 100 or below. Okay with 110 or below. And uh, I want your HDL high enough so that it's in a three to one ratio. 
So somewhere between 50 and 70, 50 and 80, okay? Ideally between 60 and 80. I want a little higher than 50, 59 or above ideally as well. But what's often lacking is that someone's cholesterol can be fine, but their CRP can be elevated and their homocysteine can be elevated because of inflammation, not cholesterol production by the liver. Because the liver makes the majority of your cholesterol in your body, endogenously makes about 80% of that. Here's the important thing. 50% of the people out there will die of a heart attack, but don't have high cholesterol. But they very well may have had high CRP and high homocysteine, showing inflammation of those arteries, which led to some type of arterial-based constriction, which led to the heart attack. And that's why, in my opinion, it's mandatory. And I just find it shocking that more doctors are not running these numbers. So what I'd love for you to do is simply write these ones down, see if your PCP will run them. That's the best thing that you can do. If not, functional medicine doctors and practitioners, naturopaths, we can all run everything except the blood work. If you're a licensed doctor, you can run blood work. And the reason you have to be a licensed doctor is because blood work diagnoses disease. So just really, really important to understand that. Now, we also do provide people with a link that we can't, we can't do it for them, but you can actually get your own lab kit sent to you for your blood work. And you know what? I wasn't going to do that, but I'm going to do it because that is my mission and that is my goal to make sure you're always allowed to take back control of your health. So I'm going to provide the company right now that also will do yearly blood work. And it's the same company that I'm using right now myself and I've been using for the last 10 years actually. So I'll put that right in there. I'm just not going to name it just in case that changes in the future, but simply go to stephencabral.com forward slash one zero one two. And I will link up the thyroid adrenal hormone test that you can do right at home. And then I will link up the blood work that you can also do if you prefer. So hopefully today's podcast was helpful. Kind of a public service announcement, public warning. I do really appreciate all of your listens and all of your shares. If this information was helpful, please do feel free to pass along to anyone else it may serve. Ever wonder what the best sauna, blue blockers, sleep trackers, wake lights, salt lamps, or other health gadgets are? Or what about the top non-toxic mattresses, sheets, soaps, bath products, toothpaste, and cookware? Or would you like to know the cleanest choices for hemp hearts, meal delivery services, supplements, and much more? I personally curated, researched, and now created a resource page of all of my top picks that continues to grow each week. These are the exact products I use in my own life, with my family, in my private practice, and they're the ones I trust. To find out all of my up-to-date recommendations and all the details, simply head on over to stephencabral.com forward slash resources. 